Well, thank you for all coming. Um, this is uh, our fifth presentation in our series, Sustaining the Earth. My name is Joe Kupfer. I'm the director of the Center for Excellence in the Arts and Humanities, and it is our program. Uh, I'd like to remind you of a couple of things. There are some books for sale outside, out the door, not outside, outside. And um, there are little sheets on your seats that we would like you to fill out. We are required to have you all fill these out for our Humanities Iowa grant, which is one of the funders of our program. And so I want to just briefly tell you who our co-sponsors are. Since the topic is sustaining, they are helping sustain the program. The American Intercultural Studies Program, the Ames Historical Society, and the Ames Public Library have all contributed to our program. The Bioethics Program, the Brunier Art Museum, and our College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. The Committee on Lectures, the Departments of Chemical and Biological Engineering, Geologic and Atmospheric Sciences, the Department of Horticulture, the Department of Natural Resources, Ecology and Management, Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies, Educational Leadership and Policy Studies, Graduate Program on Sustainability, the Greenlee School of Journalism and Communication, the Institute of Science and Society, the Iowa State University Council on Sustainability, Iowa State University Extension to Families, the F. Wendell Miller Lecture Fund, the Leopold Center, and the Ryman Garden. So lots of people are keeping us afloat. And, um, and I'm going to turn the podium over to my good colleague, Jean Goodwin, who is our own resident scholar of rhetoric, who will introduce our guest tonight. Um, so I'm honored, but also somewhat anxious uh, at the challenge of introducing our guest tonight, Tarla Ray Peterson, because of the interdisciplinary reach of her scholarship. Uh, since her dissertation work at Washington State University in 1988, Dr. Peterson has combined uh, ethnographic methods of data collection drawn from the social sciences with humanistic techniques of rhetorical analysis. And she now holds, as you can see on the slide, the Boone and Crockett Chair. Yes, that is Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett, Chair of, uh, in the Department of Wildlife and Fishery Sciences at Texas A&M University. In her numerous publications, including Sharing the Earth, a groundbreaking book-length treatment of the discourse of sustainability, um, her edited collection, Green Talk in the White House, which is available out there, she's shown a persistent concern, and numerous, numerous other publications, uh, which I will not note. Uh, she's shown a persistent concern for uh, research that will advance democratic practices, small d democratic practices. Dr. Peterson's work reveals to us the places where our ideological armor is cracking and where change therefore is possible, the edges where people of diverse views can meet and exchange perspectives, and the spaces for, pers uh, the spaces for reflection which communication theory can open for environmental practitioners and environmental activists. So tonight she's going to speak to us about climate change. Uh, the title of her talk is still one for all, all for one. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tarla Ray Peterson. Thank you, Jean. Um, can you hear me in the back of the room? Okay, good. Uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk with you about uh, environmental rhetoric and its relationship to sustainability. Uh, it's one of the things that I find most interesting in life, and thank you for your very generous uh, introduction, G. Uh, this evening, what I would like to do is talk about specifically how environmental rhetoric has functioned in the climate change movement here in the United States. First of all, let me talk a little about rhetoric. Um, we humans are in materially embedded in a biotic community. All of us are. But at the same time, our perspectives on that biotic community that we are part of have to be anthropocentric and they are wholly political. So given these conditions that, that we exist within, we communicate with each other, and I think one reason we do that 
is to understand, but we also, we don't just want to understand whenever we communicate, we also want to influence each other, and we're also defining our own personal identity and characterizing other peoples and other groups. Um, up here, I, I think, yes, I have my working definition of environmental rhetoric, and the, the main point is partly what Jean made, is that I think that part of rhetoric is this practice of developing and es establishing and, and keeping strong these democratic conditions that enable us to recognize others, not just ourselves. And it's important to me that we're, we include both the, the other that we include is not just those of us in this room, but it's also people who don't speak, and it's also non-human animals or extra-human animals. Um, by really studying environmental rhetoric, what I hope to do is then gain a better understanding of the way we humans relate to the biosphere and how our politics connect into that, and expand the concept of the appropriate interlocutors. Who gets to play in the game? Who gets to be part of the conversation? And then finally, examining the role of dissent. And today I'm going to focus on the second and third of these objectives, specifically as they relate to the issue of climate change. Climate change works really well for rhetorical exploration because nobody is immune to climate change. Um, you might think you are in some way, um, but you're not. Our options may differ. If you live on the island nation of Tuvalu, you're either going to drown or you're going to move. That's the way it is now. If you are a real estate developer on Galveston Island, your beach houses are going to go on stouter concrete pillars and you can have better anchors into the coral of the barrier island and you're going to make sure that you are well insured. But either way, it's influencing you. And it's bigger than all of us. That's one of the real challenges with climate change. It's, it's, and it's been going on longer than any humans have been on the planet. But what we, I think, ought to be worried about, and I think what the climate change movement in the U.S. is about, is the rate of that change. The vast majority of temporal and spatial uh, scales that have to do with climate change make it relatively easy for those who are in powerful positions to downplay their own rhetorical strategies and tactics while they strategically curtail the rhetoric or discourse of other <coughs> citizens. In the United States, this has been seen with climate change as the Bush administration systematically curbed development of carbon emissions policy by defining climate scientists and activists as alarmist, extremist, agenda-driven, as opposed to the supposedly moderate position of the White House, um, which seems a little ridiculous if you go anywhere other than the United States. But Part of the reason that it's not been so difficult for them to do that is because of the vast temporal and spatial scale that you have to deal with in climate change. It's not, it's not ever accurate to say this specific hurricane was caused by climate change because you can't do that. It makes it much harder to deal with the issue. So before I go any further talking about this, let me just kind of outline what I want to share with you tonight. First of all, I'm going to just quickly remind us that we need to question that nature-human dualism that we've inherited from Plato. Second, suggest an alternative perspective that considers humans 
an integrated part of the world community instead of apart from it, a sort of community that would certainly include us but would not be limited to us. And then third, I want to note that expanding any community requires effective avenues for dissent because expanding a community like this is quite a radical move to try to make. And I want to use the rhetoric of Step It Up 2007 as a contemporary example of such use of public dissent. And then specifically, I want to talk about how they used <coughs> new communication media, which I think is one of the most interesting aspects of political dissent nowadays. Um, so let's go back to the beginning real quick. Not the <coughs> beginning, beginning. <coughs> As many of you, are, I'm sure, know, the Enlightenment writings of men such as Francis Bacon, Rene Descartes, David Hume, John Locke, I could go on, all of these people are crucial to modern science. They're deeply influenced by Plato's allegory of the cave. In the cave, remember, human society is living there and they are the cave is formed and, and our ability to understand is formed by our own delusions. We only see shadows. Only the philosophers who have freed themselves from social biases like politics, values, any subjectivity, have the ability to escape the cave and they can access real reality nature, thereby enabling them to have an ability to assess truth. The rest of us see only shadows. So the philosophers have the duty and ethical responsibility to return to the cave and reveal the truth to us. This myth has created a huge rupture between nature and society. It emerges in the dichotomy between human subjects and non-human objects. And there's a dualistic juxtaposition then that comes from that between the socio-symbolic world and the natural world on the other side. And if you have any doubt how fundamental that is, I put this up here. This is a statement from the title of one of NSF's flagship, most innovative programs. And it is, depending on the time you look it up, it's either um, the coupled natural and human systems, or the coupled human and natural systems. Coupled human and natural systems makes a better acronym. But either way, they're separate. So in our enlightened age, we see that scientists have inherited the responsibility from philosophers. Now it is the scientist who has the responsibility of interpreting reality for the rest of us because they can access nature outside the cave, they can assess truth. And then, of course, they have the responsibility to tell the rest of us. While it gives us and also some scientists the comforting illusion of objectivity, it then, of course, at the same time, though, it has to strip them of any political rights and responsibility because they can't be political. So. There are problems with this. Does this line of reasoning therefore just lead us into a morass of radical social constructivism? I don't think so necessarily. In that view, you still have positivism's tendency <coughs> to separate the natural and material world on one side from the constructed and symbolic world on the other side, but in that world nobody ever leaves the cave. So with the solipsism of a strong constructivist paradigm, what you have is everything that is not myself is a social construct. Everything that's outside of me. Um, it cripples new conservation initiatives by suggesting that the truth is whatever those who have the power to speak say that it is. If ecological problems were only social constructs, then changing the terms, changing the rhetoric alone would solve them. When George W. Bush tells us the earth is not warming, the earth would not be warming. Oops, I hit the wrong button. 
So, so what's an alternative for this? I find a valuable alternative in looking at Aldo Leopold's land ethic, in specifically in in his attempt to develop a community. What he's talking about as a land community is a place where humans join extra humans as part of the community. It offers a springboard for a more integrated understanding of the relationship between human society and Earth. If you read from his Sankani Almanac, he says the land ethic simply enlarges the boundaries of the community to include soils, waters, plants, and animals. It changes the role of Homo sapiens from conqueror of the land community to plain <coughs> member and citizen of it. That's a very different role. In his land community, we have a society of interdependent human and extra-human citizens that participate in decision-making and exercise rights that they have. Now, I'm using the term land community, as Leopold does, by the way, to include aquatic and atmospheric elements also. And I'm not arguing, this is very important, that acting in an ethically responsible or ecologically sensitive manner will call such a community into being. Rather, I would like to argue that such a community exists. It makes demands on us. It demands that we recognize it and other members of the community. We have a choice as to whether or not we will accept those demands despite the realization that the demands will always remain impossible for us to completely satisfy. But without the arbitrary boundaries of Plato's cave, where we're part of the same community, nature loses its meaning as a contrast against socio-symbolic reality, and they both become something that works together. Um, this. And in, in some senses, this notion also, it, it also draws from what you were mentioning earlier, Jim, it draws from Bruno Latour's The Politics of Nature. Rhetorically, the new nature then becomes part of the community, whereas the old nature was a part of, a part from, excuse me, the community. So we can be part of or a part from. We can think about it either way. Um, Advocating something so radical as actually expanding the community that we are citizens of requires, I think, a political system that's grounded in practices that are variously labeled as strong democracy or deep democracy, and it has to include the possibility of dissent. I think that real democracy is a very prickly practice. And when we idealize democratic politics as a clean, rational, efficient, reliable, what we do is we end up with some really negative consequences. Among those consequences are extremely apathetic people and cynical people and depressed and despairing people because they've been told that democracy is supposed to be clean and <coughs> rational. And once they get involved in it, they discover that it's messy, it's highly rhetorical, it's interest-based, it's strategic. I think that it's important, instead of focusing on the rational aspects, which I'm, yes, they're there, it's important for us to focus on strategic argument and emphasize that the, being able to dissent and argue for your point of view is as much a responsibility as it is a right. So far as I'm concerned, really, if you don't have argument when you're dealing with something that really is an issue, then you really don't have meaningful democracy working. If we can reach beyond the view of humans as something that is apart from the natural system, 
we can look to ecology also to find lessons for survival. In, we can find this in our own biological grounding. Living organisms, each one has to retain its own individuality. At the same time, it engages in symbiotic relationships with others. Likewise, the survival or the sustainability of both human society and individual humans depends on maintaining appropriate relationships at the same time we have to retain our own individuality. Step It Up 2007 offers a case study of social movement organizing in the service of the sustenance or the survival of human society. I'm sure that if climate change, if the rates keep increasing at the current rate, uh, which of course they won't because things change, one change creates other changes and then you have a whole cascade of changes, there's no reason to assume that other beings can't continue to exist on this earth, but humans, the human species has some pretty narrow window of, we have some very specific requirements for our own survival. And so I think that looking at climate change and this social movement, the climate movement that is kind of building is really, really relevant to all of us. I'm using Julie Shutton's definition of new social movements, by the way, um, which is somewhat different from the traditional um, sociological view of social movements in the past, as collectives whose rhetorics, and so notice all these specific words, constitute ideologies, values, and identities that are either opposed to or provide an alternative to the status quo. Can have, deal with both, both being in opposition to and also providing an alternative. Traditional political organizing strategies play a less central role than they did in the past, although the contemporary scene still offers opportunities for movement members to participate in rallies and march. These are not the central requirements to be a member of a social movement anymore. Instead, activists take part in cyberspace movements, they stay informed via email, online alternative news sources, blogging, chat forums. Uh, any of you who have been paying attention to the recent presidential election in the United States have seen a huge change in the way people are activated and motivated. Sometimes they don material items or activist swag to signal their membership in movement. Several scholars also claim that the internet is important because it allows anonymous and thus unconstrained political dialogue, therefore enabling people who fear direct participation to participate. I think it makes, uh, I, maybe it's because I'm such a, a big, so I'm so moderate on so many things, I'm terribly boring that way. But I think it makes more sense to argue that the internet offers different venues for dissent, not necessarily completely safe venues, nor does it offer a complete substitute for embodied participation. But it does include some venues that are less risky for people than embodied protest, and sometimes that works well for getting started. During the summer of 2006, Bill McKibben, who was here apparently on a book tour recently, right? And some of his students from Middlebury College in Vermont organized a five-day walk across the state. The purpose was to gain media awareness for human-induced climate change and to call out their local leaders, pressuring them to commit to supporting national carbon emission reduction policy. Even though the event attracted a thousand walkers, it gained hardly any media attention. Did any of you hear about it? Usually nobody, if I ever asked people, they didn't hear about it. I didn't hear about it either. In January 2007, McKibben and six of his students responded to the low media coverage and they launched stepitup2007.org using open source and just 
they were going to do this on the internet. It asked ordinary people across the nation to organize climate action rallies in their hometowns and it urged people to focus on America's iconic places. There was one central requirement and that was that you were supposed to have a banner asking for, does anybody in here know this? Asking Congress to reduce <coughs> carbon dioxide emissions by 80%. 2050. Hey. <laughs> it's on the slide. Oh. Ah. <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, April 14th, 2007 was Step It Up's first d day of climate action. I've gotten off here. And communities came together in more than 1,400 places, all holding up banners that said, Step it up, Congress, cut carbon 80% by 2050. <coughs> On that night, photos streamed in from all across the country, from underwater in Key West, to dwindling glaciers in Wyoming, to the levees of New Orleans. And a research group, you can tell that the people right there are a research group um, that I'm part of, because we look kind of nerdy, don't we? We decided this step it up thing is really interesting and we're going, to, uh, we're going to go and explore it in all these different locations. Do, I have to hope a few of you recognize this shot. Thank you, Jean. Um, and we want to study how this social movement is developing. And so we did that and, uh, and we wrote a book about it. The second nationwide day of climate change occurred on November 3rd, 2007, and this time national organizers asked citizens to organize rallies in places that honored national leaders. Then, less than a year <coughs> after they guided local organizers to produce events in over a thousand locations around the U.S., the Step It Up crew announced that having helped launch a new coalition of the movement, we're folding our headquarters into this larger One Sky initiative. Many thanks for being on the ground floor of history. That's a pretty short movement, isn't it? Less than a year? And they're folding into something else. The Step It Up homepage basically had offered an invitation to help start a movement, to take one spring day and use it to reshape the future. If you looked on One Sky's homepage at the same time that Step It Up was folding into one, one Sky, you saw a goal to amplify and reinforce the powerful work of the growing movement across this country. The presumption is that now the movement has been started, so now it requires amplification and reinforcement. But now One Sky has to do something to retain the sense of urgency because it's not starting something like Step It Up was. So they use phrases on their website such as this year, right now, marks a turning point in human history. We have arrived at our nation's defining challenge and greatest opportunity because the truth is clear. People cause global warming and people must fix it immediately. So that's what you find on the One Sky website. Now, I gave a really quick story of Step It Up comes and goes, and now it's woven into One Sky and 350.org and other organizations um, that are working specifically to push for policy political policies that actually will create legislation to curb, to require curbing carbon dioxide emissions. Um, so how did the organizers, particularly those organizers of Step It Up, use new media? Because that's how, that's how they did this. They, I mean, they were all sitting in Vermont while they were putting together this movement I would call it a campaign as part of a movement all over the country. And I want to talk just a little bit about some of the things that they, that they did rhetorically. First of all, 
They use new media to inform people. This is the basic thing that we tend to think of communication for, right? Pass the information to the folks, right? That's what we're supposed to do. They, they provided all kinds of information on their website to educate visitors on more general climate change <laughs> political issues and scientific issues and also on uh, campaign management, uh, things like how to, uh, what, what the rules are now in a post 9-11 world you have, if, if you're going to organize a march or a rally, it's a little bit more complicated than it used to be. And they had all that stuff on the website. So if you'd never done any organizing, that was okay. You could be a complete novice and they'd walk you through it. Um, they also included pictures of events whose photos were taken in advance. Uh, they had links to climate change music. Uh, they had lots of people brought music uh, and the, at the end, I'm going to play one of the pieces that was uh, that the Vermont walkers used as their anthem, and various collaborators, and there was also a blog that you could participate in. Local organizers also used the information that was provided on the website at their local events. For example, at Step It Up San Antonio, which was the one I went to, the rally organizers planted the answers to trivia questions in the audience so that the crowd would be ready to answer quickly when they shouted out the questions so they could give away their fluorescent light bulb. So, for instance, the speaker said, now, what do we do about water protection projects? The crowd yells back, rainwater capture, low flow toilets. The speaker says, low flow toilets? Did anyone say that? Someone was supposed to say that. <laughs> so it was very much amateurish, but it was also very exciting. So in addition to the information then, they also created a compelling visual experience on that web page. What they did was they combined the possibilities that we have now with new communication technology of the fast message delivery that we have with broad distribution capabilities with the filmic technique of combining multiple images. In film, collage can recreate important narrative moments. You've all seen this happen in a movie. It can achieve visual contrasts or even attempt to portray the experience of memory for people. For Step It Up, the rhetorical possibilities of new media <coughs> brought these filmic techniques together and the scrolling action of these images. Now, to tell you the truth, this is one that I had my tech person at Texas A&M just put a loop of, scroll of images on here because the first time I tried to show something like this, I needed the internet and I couldn't get the internet. So if, but if you, go, if you go to the website, you can still see these and they just go on and on and on for all of these different sites from all across the country. And as you watch them, it helps to build a sense of anticipation. What's going to be next? It suggests a national presence, because you see cities and states from all across the country. And of course, the message that it's supposed to deliver is that decision makers ought to pay attention to this, because this is happening in small town America, in cities. It's happening in red states and blue states. It's everywhere. The Step It Up website also focus on the power of shifting from centralized to grassroots power, in this case from Washington DC and the White House to local events or um, cities and urban planning. Uh, the, what is that, the Green Cities Initiative and the, the Mayor's Initiative for Climate Change played a big role in many of the local Step It Up events. The focus was what could be achieved if citizens demanded that their government listen to them. Uh, here's, let me give you a, a just short quote from their website. The other side in this battle has essentially unlimited resources. ExxonMobil, for instance, made more money than any company in history last year. And according to a recent report, they spent a nice chunk of it spreading disinformation about climate change. But we can beat them. If enough of us mobilize, our sheer numbers will outweigh their special influence. All right? 
And again, this idea carries through to the way local leaders linked their local issues to the national and international issue. This is also back at Step It Up, and down in the corner, uh, far left corner, you see a county commissioner of Bayer County. The co that's the county that, or I guess it's on your right corner, right? The guy's standing there going like this. Now, let me give you just a little quotation from his speech. And uh, don't ask me to explain the logic because it's a, it's a little hard to follow. Sometimes that's not what makes a speech really successful, right? He said, if we're not careful, we're going to build multi-level parking garages into eternity when you and I know we could do something better if we would just power up to the plate and make sure that we produce the kind of a thinking eclectic if an army marches on its stomach, a democracy marches on its education and information. And I submit to you, that's the glory of this moment here, in front of the Alamo, where we talk about what we can do, what we should do, and what we must do. Let's step it up and make it happen. And then he almost fell off the back of a little platform. <laughs> and the crowd just roared, yay! They were all really delighted, OK? They were ready to step it up and make it happen. Because they could do it there. Step It Up also used new media, their new media organizing, and the way that they put this together. They encouraged networking between activist groups all across the country. This is um, the raging, a ga this is a gaggle of grannies. The raging grannies is a loosely organized network that originated in Victoria, British Columbia in 1987 and it now includes members in Canada, the US, Australia, Greece, and the United Kingdom. The grannies got hold of this and decided that wherever they had gaggles they were going to attend, step it up, and at the Raleigh, North Carolina event, which is the one I have pictured up there, they appeared dressed in pale green Lady Liberty costumes to sing a series of patriotic songs reworked with, lo with global warming lyrics. And at the conclusion of the final song, the grannies all over the country, not just these here in Raleigh, raised the compact, compact fluorescent lamps that they had been holding in their right hands. So they linked through this standard organizing template from the web with their ironic renditions of traditional patriotic songs, and they paired a sense of shared community with this timely, practical, individual suggestion of combating global warming with compact fluorescent light bulbs. And they did this all within the framework of the larger organizing template of Step It Up Nationwide. So, there are, this was really, I think, a really interesting campaign to watch unfold. And it was, from, from my perspective also, from, the, from a researcher's perspective, it was really interesting to get to watch it as it happened and to talk to the organizers as they were planning things and know what they hoped would happen before you saw what, how things worked out and that. And, and so I think from a from doing research, this was a really fun activity for us. Plus, we had our network, just like the Step It Up network, of researchers, and we had several, we'd have conference calls regularly to talk about what, it, what was happening now on the website and what would, should we be doing and plan what we would do at the events that we were able to visit and that sort of thing. So lots of good things happened out of this. And there are, of course, lots of complications. And everything didn't work out just exactly the way that the organizers would have liked it to have worked out. And I'm going to just mention four of them um, and talk just a little bit about what the organizers, either at the national or local level, tried to do to deal with those tensions. Okay, the first one I want to talk about is the tension between unification and fragmentation. And by the way, before I go through these, I want to mention again, I want to come back to your theme of sustainability. Uh, this definitely is very grounded in Step It Up and climate change and this very specific campaign and movement. But it's, it's relevant to any efforts to moving us toward more sustainable approaches 
because it's going to take concerted effort because we're, it's, it's asking for fundamental change and that doesn't happen easily. There's, if there was nothing but the inertia to overcome, that would, be, that would make it difficult. And there's far more than the inertia to overcome. So the first one I want to talk about then is the split between unification and fragmentation. There were tensions between these two needs. First, there's a need for unity. If this is all one campaign leading to one movement, but there's also the need to attend to the fragmented messages that are important to local audiences. If you're going to have this happen everywhere in the country. At an event in Salt Lake City, Utah, over 30 advocacy groups attended. Three out of the 30 focused on climate change whereas most identified different problems ranging from eating meat to storage of nuclear waste. And all those things could be connected to climate change because you can connect everything to everything, but they didn't. The biggest table, which you're looking at, at the San Antonio event focused on international trade, which is a huge issue down there for us. Fair trade, free trade, those kinds of things. And I don't know how, what the best way is to, you know, to, in each, each, in any one place, the correct spot between unification and fragmentation is probably a little bit different. Another tension that they had to negotiate is the, I would call the tension between mainstream and movement. In a lot of places, Step it, people wanted Step It Up to be something that everybody could feel comfortable in. Could, you could bring your toddler there and they would be safe. And that was the case in most of the Step It Up, most of the Step it up events. In Salt Lake City, again, and in Dallas, Texas, um, Step It Up sponsored concerts. Uh, a couple of my students, my graduate students, went up to the Dallas uh, event, Step It Up events, and in both, and some other people on our team were in Salt Lake City, in both cases, most attendees had no idea that their event was about climate change. It was a free concert, and they were coming for the free concert. And when we interviewed the event organizers afterward, we learned that was a deliberate choice on their part. They were afraid of arousing hostility if they mentioned climate change too explicitly. But then we thought, but they, and then they pointed out to us that they had some informational materials so that people hopefully would come to the concert and maybe they'd pick up some informational materials, but they were not in any place where you were very likely to see them unless you went looking for them and you knew there was something that you should be looking for. So, I think that there was a little problem, at least in those cases. They wanted so badly to be mainstream that all it was was a free concert for just about every, for everybody we talked to who was attending, just coming. Okay, another tension that you have to think about and that they had to deal with is that I'll call it, and yes, that's blank on purpose, the tension between solidarity and diversity. And this is something that has had, it's been an issue in the environmental movement for a long, long time. Both at the national and the local level, Step It Up was characterized by lack of noticeable, <coughs> visible diversity among the organizers, among the speakers, among the participants. Based on, let me give you some, some numbers here. Based on the 2000 census, San Antonio's population is 58.7% Hispanic. All the organizers for the San Antonio event were non-Hispanic white. It's also about 10% African American. There were no African Americans at the event. There was one Hispanic adult speaker, a state representative at the event, and his little toddler daughter. And they stood out, quite obviously, in the non-Hispanic white crowd. The problem was not limited to visible diversity either. 
Oakland, California, where we had a team also, is the home of several, it's the center, organizationally, for several prominent environmental justice organizations, none, zero, were at the Oakland action. Um, we talked to the national organizers about this, and of course, guess what, they were six idealistic, young, non-Hispanic, white people from Vermont. And they didn't know the people who they needed to get in touch with in Oakland. And so one of the things that they, at least they claimed, to, that they learned out of this was that they needed to go through some of the existing networks that may not have been set up specifically about climate change, but complementary topics. For all, ah, uh, the last one. The last one is the tension between the virtual and embodied activism. There have been plenty of scholars who have talked about how putting your body on the line actually has political power. It helps those of us who are just sitting there not doing anything and not really realizing how serious the issue is, realize that it must be serious because someone's willing to put their body on the line. Um, you can look back at analyses of events that happened in the civil rights movement in the U.S. You can look back to Gandhi's Salt March. Um, you can look back, you, uh, lots of places. So if everything is safe, if all of the radical, dangerous stuff can be said anonymously on the web, what happens to the power, the political power that comes from the audience? I'm not, I'm not sure how we're going to work that out again. It was important, I think, for Step It Up to be a place that was safe for those who wouldn't have wanted to come to a protest march. But it also led to some disappointment among people who wanted it to be more of a protest. We found that when we interviewed people. We found that also, one of the, another thing that we did was um, when we had opportunities to go back and talk to event organizers, local organizers, um, we, we met with them. We met with people in Seattle last spring. Uh, and a lot of the, the local Seattle organizers were, they were frustrated because they had wanted there to be something more visceral about it. And, and it was just all so nice and, and, and positive that they weren't sure if they, you know, made the point that they wanted to make, that it might, it might weaken the political credibility of the claim that this is a, a huge problem and that it needs to be immediately addressed. If it's really such something that needs such an, uh, such immediacy, why are we still, why are we, why are we just singing and dancing and having free concerts? So that's the, another unresolved tension that we have to deal with when we're looking at how new media influence <coughs> How we, do, how we deal with social movements. <coughs> Basically, though, I think, um, myself, I'm, I'm, I think that Step It Up was really a cool campaign. I think it was really <laughs> exciting. Uh, lots of people, if nothing else, so, and this is one of the things that uh, Bill McKibben noted, is they trained a whole lot of community organizers all over the country out of this, which is also a really good thing that happened. <laughs> Um, basically, what they were able to do was they were able to use new media to inform interested publics, to provide compelling visual experience then, to motivate action by emphasizing and showing how you could shift power away from Washington, and 
offering opportunities for people to network with each other. Whenever we engage in any kind of environmental rhetoric, and particularly when it's something like this where we're attempting to motivate social change, it's real important for us to realize that we're engaging in a political task, I want to emphasize that again, of amplifying and translating voices of somebody. They might be humans, they might be extra humans, but we need to remember that that's a political task, not a revelatory task. We're not revealing something. We are making a political strategic choice. And it always needs to remain open to retranslation. Whenever we represent another community member, whether it's human or otherwise, the photographer here, you notice, is acting politically by choosing to frame her fellow subjects who are fishing, and I promise you they're playing too, in a particular way. She could frame it differently depending on what statement she wants that photo to make. The rhetoric of Step It Up 2007, I think, helped expand the possibilities of what counts as a real movement experience. It, didn't, it doesn't have to be, more people came to realize it doesn't have to be what they don't have to be out there getting uh, beat up with rubber hoses or something. They still can participate. And who counts in the conversation? Who gets to participate? And I think that we have to continue working hard on expanding that sort of thing more and more because, of course, our sustainability both as humans and as the extra humans out there besides us share in any environmental loss and we also may celebrate it 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 may celebrate recovery if we are able to push toward that recovery i want to let you listen to a bit of this one of the step it up songs and by the way if you go to step it up on the website, you can see and hear and download this music. Listen to these words. The time has come to break bad habits. It's time to turn the wind and sun. Just a little more power from above. Just a little more faith, respect, and love for this old earth. Our only home. To say no to that power from below, but there's salvation in the power from above. There's a better way than barrels of oil. There's a better way than loves of gold. There's a better way to work together. Renewable power, that's our goal. See, you, what you do rhetorically, strategically there, you appeal to the evangelical drift in the United States and bring that into your movement. Why not? Thank you. I'm not sure what I should say about them, except that it's really, it would be uh, very short-sighted for uh, 
people who've been more traditionally leading the environmental movement not to take advantage of, of this group of very powerful, uh, they're very powerful in the, in the sense that uh, they have they have civic authority granted them, even though they are. Well, think about it. Over the past eight years, we've had a lot of. We're not. We don't need to separate church and state in this country, right? Okay. So, churches are really important, and evangelical leaders have. And there's no reason at all why Genesis can't be interpreted in the way that you focus on stewardship and dominion rather than domination and take advantage of those things. But at the same time, <coughs> realize that you're talking about, in fact, I think this, I, I would call this more a tactic rather than a strategy because I think it might be, you know, I, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't just completely say, I'm going to not worry about it and we'll just turn it over. We'll turn the movement over to these folks. But it would be, it's a really valuable, it's a tactic that of course you want to use. Yeah, Jim? Is that live? But I can hear you. Yeah. So, so I want to ask you a question about environmental communication and global climate change, but not really about the step up. Okay. You know the Stern report, the White yeah. House's response to it? So this is an economic argument about mm -hmm. the value of the future. Right. So I, I, I wonder if you could uh, help us understand that debate and, and then interpret it, make, help us make sense of it. In other words, the economists basically argue that uh, economic growth will be such that the future, we shouldn't worry so much about uh, the future consequences because there will be enough wealth generated that we can take care of the problems in the future when they occur. And mm -hmm. it's a way to translate it, that's, I'm not an economist. Uh, so that, that there's a big argument about what the proper discount rate should be. And right. That's how much money we should spend now Mm -hmm. Solve problems that will take place in the future. Right. Can you help us understand that issue and uh, interpret it? Um, I don't know if I can help you understand it or not, but I can. I can. I can talk about it. Okay. <laughs> um, first of all, I think it's important, really important, what important to look at the rhetoric of economics. Okay, because that's and that's what you're asking about is what what is the rhetorical strategy of the of the uh, economic argument you know what and and there's always going to be I mean there there's always going to be an open space around exactly what the correct discount rate should be um, but I think that it's also really important to uh, for me anyway I mean, the Stern Report was put together by economists, too. And the Stern Report suggests that um, there are problems not in the future, but there are problems right now already um, that are costing us dollars in today's dollars. For instance, the, at least what I'm familiar with would be uh, clean up around the Gulf from uh, still from Hurricane Katrina that hasn't take, uh, happened, and from Hurricane Ike most recently, uh, the just leveled part of Galveston Island, and those are costs that are happening, you know, as we speak. Um, I think it's I think it's naive for us to realize to think that. The uh, people who make whatever whatever claim they make, a claim I make or anybody else, that they didn't have, they didn't put some thought into it beforehand. That they, it's it's naive to assume that people didn't strategically think about the discount rate that 
and, and use a minimal discount rate um, or a maximal discount rate. I think that another way to look at, uh, look at the, the arguments over what we should do about uh, climate change, if we should do anything about it, if we should put resources into it, uh, and if you, that one way that kind of moves you into that rhetorical stream so that you're talking their language is to look at what the insurance industry is coming out with. Because the insurance industry, I promise you, they are not doing this because they're environmentalists. They're concerned about their profits. They're an industry. Um, just like they're just as much an industry as um, ExxonMobil is an industry. So one of the things that I think is really valuable to do is to look at what the insurance companies are projecting and some of the, I mean, some of the lawsuits right now in the Northeast where the states are suing the EPA because the EPA won't let them implement their uh, attempt to mitigate for climate change by, by, uh, by requiring the limitation of carbon dioxide emissions. They're using for, for a warrant to support their argument, they're using the insurance companies because with the idea that if the insurance companies think this is a risk that is uh, going to be expensive enough, soon enough, that they want it figured into their calculus, then we think that we should be able to figure it into, and we should figure it into ours. So I think that's, that's one thing. I, I think you, you can go into their line of talk through the insurance companies, because they, in, in this case, they actually provide a nice, uh, you know, relatively, I say relatively, uh, but a relatively neutral kind of source for determining what kind of a discount rate is appropriate. Because for them, they just don't want the problem. Uh, I mean, they don't want to have to pay out, right? So they have a huge interest in accuracy. They probably have more interest in accuracy than anybody else. And I think you can make that argument. Um, I don't know, sorry. I have a couple questions. Uh, one of your slides said that the social movements have values, identities, and ideologies. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, uh, in your, your study of uh, One Sky, is it of a scale that you consider a social movement? And, um, and for whatever social movement you would identify around climate change, how would you define the, the uh, values, identities, and ideologies of climate change social Okay, do, do you mean One Sky or Step It Up, the one that I mostly took? Either, either one? one? Okay, because I don't know enough about One Sky really to tell you, okay, to, to be honest. Oh, by the way, there is somebody here, before I answer that question, there's somebody here who's from One Sky, uh, raise your hand, okay, and she's got some informational material outside, and on November 18th, there is an opportunity, there's an event, and you're going to have to explain it. Um, yeah, on, on November 18th, there's a, a similar day of action. Um, about three quarters of Congress is going to get hit with welcome cards from community organizers and people, volunteers all over the country. Um, so it's just, hey, welcome to the 111th Congress. I can't wait to see what you do on climate change. Um, so, and, and also, there's been a couple other days of action. Thank you. Okay. Okay. First of all, I don't see uh, One Sky or, uh, like I say, I, I haven't studied One Sky very much, or Step It Up as a movement themselves, even though they did claim that they were out to start a movement. That's what they said. Come join us and help us start a movement. 
I think that will, I, I define them as a campaign in the climate movement. There is a climate movement, I think, afoot in this country. And so I would say there is a climate movement, but I'm not, I wouldn't define, I wouldn't, if, if in order to say, yes, it was a success, you have to say that one sky or step it up was a movement in itself, I'd say, no, nope, I guess they failed. But they were very successful, I think, in doing a lot of movement toward a movement, all right? Then ideologies, values that are important um, for this particular group. Um, I think that one of the, one of the things that's, that's really important that fits in, in my view, fits into the uh, more of the ideological rather than values category is the idea that the government is responsible for doing something about this. That, and, and that's an ideological, there, there's a, you know, some people would say, well, you give it to the government and then it's just ruined, it's, it's destroyed, it, it should all be done by individuals. Or other people would say it's all institution, it all has to be done from the top or uh, it's just not going to happen. Something this big as climate change, you know, it's, it's the whole world, so it doesn't, uh, you know, it's got to be done nationally. All these uh, clean cities kinds of things and stuff like that, that's irrelevant. But I think there is a real strong ideological commitment to the fact that this needs to be, this, this needs to become part of the regulatory framework, okay? I think there is definitely a, a um, you know, a leaning towards assuming that there has to be institutional responsibility. But there's also, um, one thing that I think is really interesting is that this is um, this is a very friendly group. <laughs> um, I mean, it really is. Uh, everywhere, all across the country. I mean, this is a people are very happy to be, and they're not. A lot of times, when you get involved with people who are engaged in any kind of protest action, there's people are so angry. But, uh, and and one of the people, in fact, one of the one of the fellows who's working with us on our project is really he's he's really frustrated with Step It Up because they're not angry, and um, it's Larry Prelly, and uh, if you read some of his rhetoric of science work. And he says, you know, you can't just be smiling and happy and, and convince people that, that this is really a crisis. So I also think that that's, and I, and, I, and I think there's some of the, you know, this notion that we have now of new social movements being very much uh, kind of consumption oriented, this notion of, you know, wearing buttons and, and other, you know, gadgets and, uh, you know, going to the store to buy whatever it is to show that you're part of the movement. I think that's part of it too, which is really kind of interesting um, and confusing to me, actually. Anyway, that's... Somebody here, you, right? You had a point? I think there's time. Um, I, uh, let me start in a strange place. My daughter has a bacterial infection. She's hurting a bit. She's still able to work. Uh, she's been through three rounds of antibiotics. And I think of uh, the, the extra, we call it the extra human, mm -hmm. and the democracy and small d. And you know, the bacteria really, really, really outnumber us. <laughs> The they human do. And the, and the extra human. Mm -hmm. And in terms of your question about values um, back here and, and ideologies, it seems to me that the, you know, the climate change movement is sort of a, of a macro, a sort of <coughs> large animal movement. You know, and um, that there, there may be threats to us as humans. 
mm -hmm. that that operated at different levels, at different time scales, and I, you know, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just kind of wondering to what extent the, and I think it's philosophical, this sort of uh, human plus extra human argument is not so much Bruno Latour, but it's more a sort of fuzzy-headed Emersonian transcendentalism. And if I can just throw that out as a, as a, as a sort of a, of, a, of a challenge to your analysis of the, of the mm -hmm. ideology of, of the movements. Um, are, you, are you saying all Emerson transcendentalism is fuzzy-headed? No, 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 all. I, I don't uh, think Emerson is at all fuzzy-headed, fuzzy but a particular, uh, yeah. OK. Uh, are you, um, okay, first, if, if, you're, if you're asking me if I think that people who are part of this movement uh, are thinking consciously about humans and extra humans as conscious beings and needing to, you know, communicate with each other, or if they're thinking more in the fuzzy-headed, I think most of them are probably more in the fuzzy-headed, uh, or however you, fuzzy transcendentalism, because that's how people generally think. Is fuzzily. I mean, um, and they probably never read Bruno Latour. Um, <laughs> but for me, it helps make sense of um, for me, it helps makes it, it helps me make sense of why climate change matters because really as you said you know I mean the bacteria will probably be fine um, even if you know suddenly climate change you know super changes really really fast and it becomes as hot as Mars on the on the earth or something like that and then humans are gone and I mean but if we think of ourselves uh, if I think of myself as part of the natural community then I actually think I have more of a stake in more of a I guess uh, more of a right or a claim on making management decisions than I do if I am the person in charge who has pseudo control. Like, I don't think, um, I'm sorry about your daughter's bacterial infection, but, uh, I mean, it, and it's making me think that that's a, a clear example of we don't have very much control. We, I mean, we like to think of ourselves as being in control of nature, but we really aren't. And climate change is one of those things that, where it's really pushing back at us. Uh, it's like, ha ha, we, you know, we thought we had it. We thought we, you know, we thought we had it all under control, but clearly we don't. So I think, so this, for me, the community metaphor actually is practical. Um, but I don't, and I don't necessarily think, and I wasn't, wouldn't try to suggest that people who are part of the climate change movement are thinking consciously along those lines. I don't think that they are. People who I've talked to, people who I've read transcripts of the interviews that other people talk to them at, you know, events all over the country. Um, I think most of them are thinking very specifically about human society and human, um, human, human technologically oriented structures and the destruction of those by climate change. And I also think part of it is just, uh, I just think it's, it's, it's now becoming trendy, you know. Uh, 
because it's uh, uh, ironically, I think that by fighting against and working so hard to delegitimize climate science, ironically, the political right has made the climate change issue a trendy issue for people who are politically activist oriented. We, I mean, they've been doing climate change research and they're, you know, for a long, long time. I mean, it didn't just start in the 1980s. It didn't just start uh, with um, reports, you know, testifying in front of Congress. Uh, it, it's been happening forever and nobody's been paying any attention to them. Um, so I think that's part of it too, is it's kind of a happening thing.